Hey guys, this is Kirov speaking and today we are going to take a look at building a car for the 1955 Bavarian Racing Challenge that just has closed its gate to new entries and that's why I'm able to show things off because otherwise we would probably have tons and tons of competitors with uh, more or less the same car which isn't much fun so yeah uh, I'm going to show you how to get a reasonable time around the test track uh, with the limitations set by Martin for this kind of race series he's running which is awesome by the way and you definitely should be joining the next one the 1965 challenge if you haven't joined this one already Alright, so how do we build a proper car for this challenge? Let's get into it! As you can see from my uh, little list of cars I have here, experimentation is probably one of the most important things when joining such a challenge. Depending on how much time you have, uh, you either make one or two or plenty of models. And uh, I definitely, in order to also try out for the game, and see how well balanced it is, I tried out many different versions of how to achieve the best times around the track. As you potentially already know, we are planning a multiplayer mode where players are presented with a randomly generated track and have to achieve the quickest time around that track uh, with a set of limitations and specifications for the cars and within a time limit. So uh, that's definitely something I'm uh, worried about balancing properly and thus I'm partaking in these challenges too. So uh, let's get into uh, designing a car though so that I can go through some of the movements to get to a reasonably performing car reasonably quickly. Right, new car. This challenge is running in 1955 and hence we are limited to the bodies available during that year. One major aspect of these bodies, uh, or most of them, is that they aerodynamically are pretty bad. So you have to have a lot of horsepower in order to push them to kind of racing speeds even. So yes, uh, one thing which was quickly discovered in the build thread for uh, this challenge was that the competitor car uh, to the vanilla cars, this one, little one here, which is a mod car by the way, um, is definitely the best choice here because it is very small, thus very lightweight. And we are dealing with 1955 tires here, which means very high profile and pretty bad multipliers for uh, added weight. Which means that normally it is like when you put more weight on top of a tire, it grips more. Um, but also, because that is not linear, uh, you are indeed losing a bit of relative grip in that uh, situation. So what we are going to do is base a version on this little car here and uh, one other aspect of it is that it's aerodynamically not quite as horrible as the others would be. Uh, probably with roof down it definitely would be and I think it's probably a bit overpowered too. The values should be a bit higher than they are uh, because I can't can see why this one would be less aerodynamic. Uh, it probably is more aerodynamic actually because uh, this little one has steeper edges and so on. It is nice and round though and very small. The small cross section is the main part we consider here right now. So yeah, let's uh, build a car based on this one. You can find it in the uh, 3D uh, modding uh, forum section and uh, enjoy building a few cars with this one as well. All right, let's get into it and uh, see what we can do. First consideration is how do we want to shape the body such that we get the optimal weight distribution and how much wheel arches do we need? Okay, 
uh, first consideration is, okay, this is a front engine car, which means for a racing car, you want to have as close to 50-50% distribution, weight distribution as possible. And why is that, you ask? Well, that is because of what I said about the tires. If you put more weight on them, they on a relative basis have less grip. So what we want to achieve is as close as possible to 50-50 weight distribution. And this would be done in this case by well, just morphing the cabin to the rear as far as possible. And now the sound puts that. Alright, now, yes. Um, what we also could do is elongate the front and shorten the rear. And that should do well. And... no, wait. R the other way around. I'm stupid. <laughs> elongate the rear and shorten the front, of course. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, uh, that's uh, pretty stupid. Anyway, uh, wheel arches, we are going to check once we have the suspension in there. And now that we are satisfied with... Oh, we can do this. No, we don't want to. Right. Um, and now that we have the body shape, uh, we can take a look at the quality here. So what does this quality do? Um, it gives us reliability and prestige, but if we set it to low values, we do get a lower weight and we reduce costs at the same time. And that sounds a pretty good thing to do for a car that is, uh, let's say, not supposed to be sold. And let's reduce this all the way down to minus 15 to have a lighter body, a less reliable body, but also a cheaper body. And here, let's just go for something which is the lightest. We don't care about rust. This car will probably crash into a barrier before it can even start rusting. So, and please note that this is, this normal steel is slightly lighter than the galvanized one. Um, then the engine placement, well, not much to choose from. Front longitudinal here in this day and age. And then we probably want to go for double wishbone suspension setup, which behaves best during uh, cornering and weight transfer, so that you um, do get better effective camber while cornering. Then comes an interesting choice. Are we going for um, steel or handmade aluminium? And that choice for this challenge is not as relevant as for other challenges which don't have a, weight, a power to weight ratio limitation. In this challenge uh, though we do have that and that is 0.2 horsepower per kilogram of mass, to total mass of the car. So if we go for handmade aluminium that would mean the car is lighter which means that we only can put in a very small engine. Then another consideration is the uh, quality slider for this one and this probably shouldn't be touched too much. You could do that but this does not only affect the uh, panels and stuff but also all the other things like suspension and we do need a very good suspension. So let's not um, choose any lower quality here but um, hmm. Let's make it the light version. This is probably what people would be going for, uh, for the most part. So it's the most natural thing to do, I think. Um, I personally, for my car, I went with steel. And because of the very light body, that's still pretty good. It gives me a lot of money over for the uh, other choices later on. But let's start with this one. All right, uh, fixtures not really needed. Oh, I, I'd like to keep those tires. I would probably, without much effort, win every race then. <laughs> that is um, a bit of an unfair advantage. So um, let's for now skip all the design stuff. We don't need it. This is just for racing. So let's put a grill on there and continue onwards. Uh, the color though, as you know, uh, putting racing stripes on a car gives you a secret plus 50 horsepower, so you definitely want to consider that. Um, so models get on that. Uh, let's make it white and we will drive. And now comes the meaty part, the engine. 
1955, you are quickly running into the problem of uh, breaking parts if you try to rev. So the most natural thing to do in this case is to go for a V8 and it's definitely the easiest choice you can make. It also is more than just easy, it's probably it's the optimal choice to make because per capacity the engines have a lower weight complete, uh, compared to inline engines because they partially share their block. And uh, that would mean that that's uh, a natural choice in this one. So, um, that, and that would be because of weight balance in the car, not because of the maximum power we can get out of it, because that again is limited by the weight to power ratio, or power to weight ratio. So let's go for a flat plane V8 because for the weight it, it has, it generates slightly more power than a uh, cross plane V8 because of higher exhaust efficiency. And well, there's not much to choose from here. We go for a cast iron and um, let's see, we are definitely going to do go down here quite a lot. A two liter engine is already pretty hefty. So let's see if we aim for uh, 1.7 liters or something like this. And then what would we go for? Um, I'm, I'm a fan of compromise in this regard. And what I did for my car, which worked out pretty well, I think, I'm at least in the midfield and I, I built a quick car. Uh, not really a um, quick around the track car, but a fast one on the straight. Um, to just get a bit of nice things to say about my car uh, while it's horribly losing in the overall standings uh, gives me a fuzzy feeling in my stomach. So uh, this one though, we are going for the compromise setup and I think a good compromise setup is a single overhead cam for valve. Uh, this engine is supposed to rev pretty high so it needs plenty of valves. Dual overhead cam though is very expensive and uh, also pretty heavy, so let's go with this one. Also consider that the pistons are not quite keeping up with the highest quality dual overhead cam setups here. Okay, uh, then definitely cast iron. Uh, let's go with, uh, that's forged components available for the first time here in 1955 and surroundings. This one, though, is completely unnecessary. So this would be the natural thing you would want to go for, usually when you see that, like, oh, let's choose a forged one. But then you see, well, maximum RPM is just the same as for the cast Conrads, so don't do that. You, know, you save a bit of money. Uh, but for the forged pistons, yeah, we may go for those, but then again, the cast conrods are not keeping up anyway so we can just go for the cast stuff and save money if our reliability gets really low and we're pushing it we could go for forge to save just a bit of uh, of reliability but for now let's keep it there maybe um, this also gives us a bit of headroom to up the quality for the compression, well, we just start out low and then we see where we end up. Uh, the cam profile, now that is a very interesting choice because we are limited by the power to weight ratio. And that means that you don't want to make as much power as possible, but you want to have the maximum power integral. And what that means is usually a middle-ish to low cam profile, if possible. Uh, another approach would be to get the uh, power you can have out of the smallest engine volume and thus the lowest weight for the engine as possible. And we are going for a middle-ish approach. We want to have a reasonable power band and a middle to low-ish weight for this engine. And 1.8 liter is probably like something like twice the size of the smallest engines in this challenge. Um, let's continue on here. Uh, naturally aspirated, uh, not much choice there yet, and oh, for the fuel, all right. So one thing we have to consider is the maximum power throughput. 
and a single barrel carb definitely doesn't cut it. Um, a two barrel carb still isn't very expensive, a four barrel carb is slowly getting there, but as we can see here, 119 horsepower, ah, that is uh, kind of not enough, I would say. Maybe it's just about at the limit. So if we go for a twin, we are running into a cost of totaling $304 uh, or money units. And that is not much compared to the $8,000 we have to our, at our proposal, uh, disposal. And then intake. Service costs don't matter in this challenge and performance intakes it takes do get us a bit more power of the engine. Um, we are allowed to use super leaded. And now for the fuel mixture, well, let's let's put it somewhere here first. Usually you would want to go for 12.7. Uh, uh, let's, let's do this, the easy approach first. I uh, just max it out. We can lower it later if we see that we are having too much power for the weight of the car in total. Uh, the timing is another interesting aspect. Uh, the engine gets more efficient up there, but also it gets more responsive and the responsiveness makes sportiness go higher. And if sportiness is higher, the car controls a bit more, uh, more difficult. And it might be the case that we are going into territory where the sportiness is so high that the car becomes difficult to control and when you put your foot down uh, accelerating out of a corner and the engine is so responsive that you basically break your neck every time the, you accelerate, uh, then that definitely doesn't help your grip on the rear wheels while accelerating out, right? So, more errors. And this needs to be considered there as well. As you can see, plenty of things to consider, but these choices we've made so far, I think are pretty natural to do. So even if you're not the best car builder in the world, uh, car builder as in, or in automation, uh, you probably see why I've chosen as I did. Uh, let's see, for the RPM limit, hmm. We are aiming at pretty high RPMs for the time period. Uh, but not ridiculous. Let's go with 7,000 in our first try. And we also do have pretty low cam profile of 45, so it's more like 6,500. And uh, let's see where we end up. So um, then, tubular is a good choice. And that is because the production units are still reasonably low. That's one advantage of the inline engines. They basically cost half of uh, the production units because they have one less bank to consider. And long tubular are definitely the lightest and they also are having their resonance frequencies pretty high up in the power band. So I think I'm going for a long tubular setup here. And let's see what is allowed by the exhaust. Single exhaust, 160, 46 horsepower. Sounds like that would be enough. And for the mufflers, uh, let's do not put anything on here. Before in automation, it was the case that if you don't put on a muffler, your car would be less tame or less drivable because of that. And that has been uh, changed for the track calculations but that is still in the normal calculations of the stats because a louder car always sounds sportier and feels sportier than a completely silent one. So that's why it's in there. And let's see, reverse flow. Um, that is not neat. No, so no mufflers here, right? And let's test the engine. Uh, 98 horsepower, but we do have plenty and plenty of fuel octane left in it. So let's see how we can go about this one. How much power are we making there? Enough, I would say. And 125, looking good. Let's let's do it like this and see. We can even up the camp, uh, the um, rev limiter a bit like this. All right, um, I think this concludes the first engine build. Just straight out of the box, use this one first and then we iterate us forwards to a workable build. And uh, now, 
let's take a look at it building the car. I still feel bad about not being able to keep those tires which are on there, but uh, okay, let's go through here. Definitely we want to have the maximum gear count. Everything else would be rather silly of us. And we do need good acceleration, but you have to consider that you only have one 0 to 100 performance requirement during each race, and that is at the start. So it's not really the 0 to 100 performance which is important to us, but more like the 40 to 120 performance, which is slow corner, out of slow corner acceleration. And uh, the top speed we also have to consider is probably never going to be reached. So you want to tune your car such that it comes uh, close to your potential top speed quicker than actually reaching the top speed. Um, so yeah, just a little compromise there again, but this is figured out during testing on the track. And we do want to have a pretty close spacing. As you can see here, the yellow marked lines is what power we have available in the various gears at the uh, different RPMs at the different speeds. So uh, we want to keep this yellow line as far up as possible. And uh, the car in the game in the track simulations shifts when there is more power available in the next gear or it runs into the rev limiter. So this would look like, um, yeah, we don't have the graph up there yet, but I think uh, spacing around 30-ish is pretty good. As you can see here, we are kind of shifting into the optimal power band for the car um, with all gears except for the shift between one to second. This is looking pretty good. Then, oh, one thing I forgot. Um, differentials, of course. So, uh, this is also about acceleration. We do have a very low drivability score for the automatic locker, but overall, considering how much wheel spin we are having, this definitely will help us in reducing uh, wheel spin and thus uh, having more drivability for the car. So, I'm going to choose this one already now and so we just see what comes out of it all right tires this is the kind of tough part i would say because um, there's not much you can do but you really would like to and we are not going to race on chunky off-roads that's for sure uh, i think for demonstration's sake i'm just going with semi slicks uh, we are allowed a maximum tire width of 175 in this challenge and rims don't really matter and let's see uh, that is the maximum wheel diameter already one problem these cars have and this time is getting to this size tires means that you only can have very very small rim diameters and as you can see i do need to run on uh, 10 inch rims in order to keep the 175 that doesn't bode too well, I would say, and that means, well, you ask, why, why is that a problem? Well, it is a problem not only for cornering stability and cornering performance, um, because the sidewalls are so large that the whole car starts to wobble, but also because that we cannot fit any brakes in this friggin' thing. So, um, yeah, let's uh, put some classic rims on there, 10-inch super rims. But we do, do want to have the maximum the maximum tire size but uh, also one little nice tip to optimize things is you want to have the smallest profile possible while keeping that width and this you do by reducing wheel diameter until it automatically shifts down the size and that will be there so we can run 545 there and then up that size that gives you a bit of better traction on the track uh, should only be like maybe a tenth of a second or something, but uh, still, it's, it's worth it. We're not allowed to uh, increase quality here. A bummer, of course, because other <laughs> otherwise everyone would be running plus 15, I guess, if they could afford it. But now brakes. Well, this is tricky, as I said. So um, we cannot really fit anything in there. 
and that means that in the front we definitely need to have race pads just to get the braking distance down and we have nothing here we can do 170 wow right let's do 170 here on the other hand considering we are going to have a lightweight car remember that we also chose um, aluminium for the bodyworks that means that we probably can get away with pretty comfortable brakes, which does not only increase comfort, but also drivability. And remember that we are aiming for a as drivable car as possible, as possible because Martin has, uh, has made it such that more drivable cars make less errors. Or oh, not the cars, but the drivers of more drivable cars make less errors. So we are going to just aim for a maybe 30 rating and then optimize it later, no big deal. But also what you want to do is definitely increase quality. One advantage of these shitty brakes is that they are pretty much for free. So let's see, uh, this rear brake for instance just costs us basically no production units and 74 material costs. And if we up this to plus 5, we are at a cost of, uh, wait is it? Where is the cost? There is the cost. Um, that is 146. So it's not that bad, but braking performance has increased a lot through the, that change. Anyway, uh, aerodynamics, pretty interesting in this day and age already. We are not allowed to use any lips or wings, and that will probably only start in this 1975 race, I would assume. And cooling capacity, well, as little as possible but we are not optimizing it to death yet because we don't know uh, if we are going to change the engine around a bit and uh, power may change and then reliability gets offset and so on and so forth so we ignore um, this little difference there for the moment and what we do not uh, forget about is to increase aerodynamic efficiency for the car this is pretty cheap because we have no under tray selected, no active stuff, no active cooling, nothing. So increasing aerodynamic quality is reasonably cheap and also makes us faster, um, like higher top speed. But also we reach, um, we accelerate better at higher speeds because of this. So it might be worth it. It might be worth it. We can see how much change this made by just moving to this slider. This really should be a tooltip in here as well, I just realized. Um, the total area we have right now is 046.1 and it was um, 048.4. So it's a small but significant difference. Two seats, of course, basic. We need no quality in there. Oh, slider followed around. Uh, entertainment non safety you don't need any there is currently a bug in the game and I would like to um, explain that one and that is if you have no safety selected then the quality quality slider does nothing if you have standard selected uh, the quality slider does something and changes these values not only the weight of this setup but also the weight of the whole car and that is deliberate the buggy thing here is not that this behavior is for standard but that there is not such a behavior for none so the thing that happens here is the safety package is very general for the game and that means that you have crumple zones and like the doors and all the different kinds of zones in the car and if you pull down the quality all those zones are weakened and lightened this reduces costs but this significantly reduces weight as you can see how cars developed in the real world, you know that, well, cars became so much heavier, like since the late 80s to uh, mid 2000s, there was a huge rise in weight. And this is mainly due to the increased safety and crumple zones and all the kinds of stuff they've put in there. And this is simulated by the slider as well, um, but it doesn't work for none. So if you want to save weight, which we kind of want to do, so let's just use it. Um, you can select standard, which doesn't cost anything anyway, and then pull the slider down, which makes the whole car much lighter. Not a bug. What the bug is, is that it doesn't make the car lighter for none. So that needs to be changed. Um, but yeah, 
let's see, Springs. Uh, that's an interesting choice as well. And I'm going to choose Progressive Springs. Yes, but this is shit for, for performance. Yes, it is. But you know what it is bad for as well? It's how sporty your car feels. So um, what we're going to do with this is that we choose Progressive Springs just to make the car a bit easier to drive. And that is kind of a little exploit say for when you are on track because that shouldn't be the case for track driving it shouldn't be easier to drive on track it should be worse to drive on track so yeah anyway uh, that's the how it works currently and um, sway bars passive 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 we start out with a sport setup here uh, up the right height just slightly 20 centimeters is still ridiculously high but uh, no quality needed for the suspension and let's test the car. Uh, we do have pretty high spottiness, that's probably because of a suspension setup which is pretty bad. We are below 600 kilos, that's really light, we have pretty good economy, but please note this economy rating is just for uh, economy cruising, which you never do in the race. And actually it is, um, Martin is looking at how the engine performs and how efficient the engine is at the current RPM. That means that he actually checks for how well optimized the engine is running uh, at, uh, for running at high RPM. If you have a high cam profile, then it is optimized for running at high RPM and thus will use less fuel. So don't be fooled by this number for this challenge. It does mean absolutely nothing. I made a car which is very economical in cruise, but actually uses much more fuel than the competition in the actual race. And I did so to optimize my power band, not to optimize fuel economy. Also we are seeing that we have plenty of monies left in, us, uh, in this to optimize the car. We are allowed to go up to 8000, but no further. All right, uh, let's take a look at this graph. And here is one of the absolutely most important parts of this challenge, and that is setting up your suspension correctly. We do not want to have catastrophic oversteer like this. We want to find a point where we have understeer, but a pretty neutral behavior up to that point. That usually gives the best overall performance. We can check this performance by going to the test track tab and looking at the cornering at 20 meters. That is your important stat because we don't have downforce anyway. Um, we also see that the weight distribution is a bit front heavy, but also we probably need to reduce engine power a bit and thus reduce engine weight at the same time. So um, let's first do a bit of engine reconfiguration to get to uh, the proper limit and then get back to the suspension tab because that engine weight in the front will drastically change what suspension setup we want to have. I just pulled out the calculator and what comes out of it is that at a weight of 590.6 kilograms, we are allowed to have a weight or a horsepower of 118. And that means that our engine is actually performing uh, a bit too well. But first of all, before we start optimizing this car, I want to just send it around the automation test track to give you a bit of a benchmark. Uh, the, well, should we do that? Yeah, let's, let's start with this. And we do have, we do have a 245.20. A reasonable time, I would say, for a very first try. But now let's see what changes if we just make a very quick change here. We want to have more grip in the rear. So we up the, oops, wrong direction. We up the camber a bit in the rear. And let's see what comes out of that. We have a much higher cornering right now. And how much did our time improve? Stop there. And now we are running a 242. Isn't that amazing? And a 242 is almost, um, almost, I would say, uh, competitive. Not really. And there's a lot more in there. You, What we are aiming for here is a 241 maybe. 
Um, we should be able to get there with this car pretty easily. Anyway, so let's uh, take another look at the engine. Uh, we did make too much power. And now you have to, con to consider which way you want to take. Um, the performance index is actually very helpful here. You want to have as much performance index as possible for the maximum allowed horsepower you have you're allowed to have so what you can do is instead of making the engine smaller you could also just reduce the cam profile but we are going to do a combination of things so uh, reducing a bore definitely helps the engine weight and we are going to do that but also we are increasing stroke a bit uh, because the engine was still running so nicely and now we still have 120 horsepower we can down this a bit more. Let's get rid of any knock. And 17, 16, very nice. Uh, what you will see is that the power band is getting a bit wider up there, which is a really good thing for us. And also the engine is getting a bit lighter. Uh, one thing we need to reconsider is the exhaust size too. And uh, that one was too small. So now we have even a better power band than before. Uh, this is all coming together nicely, 115. I'm deliberately going a bit lower because we made the engine lighter now as well. And that will again shave off a bit of maximum power we can have in the car. So 115 horsepower. Let's see what um, our... Well, oh, you see, lots of stat increases. We like that. Um, Let's see how we can optimize a bit for better acceleration. We definitely don't need to put the suspension, uh, the suspension, I mean the gearbox tuning like this so that the car actually reaches top speed. That is completely wasted acceleration in the lower end and you will never ever reach top speed anyway, like I said before. So what you're aiming for is a few clicks below the estimated top speed and that also helps you to not hit the rev limiter when you're driving downhill. Don't forget that this is the top speed estimate for a flat circuit. So um, what we could do is test out if we can get a bit better acceleration overall or reduce wheel spin. And I think, can we get a bit better there? Just slightly, six, eight. Can we get it down further? We are increasing wheel spin quite massively though. So let's not really do that. I think a 6.9 there is reasonable. Did we get a 6.8 closely? No, we didn't. Okay, I don't want to have too much wheel spin. That's, that's detrimental to the whole car. And uh, we cannot put better tires on anyway. So now let's optimize this thing a bit. Uh, we cannot really change anything here. What you could do is reduce tire width in the front to get a much more drivable car and that might even be a, a kind of reasonable thing to do depending on what car you're making but uh, in this case we're probably going aggressive there and uh, let's see for the brakes how bad is it it's really bad for the rear yep it's nice what you want to do here uh, also a tricky thing is you're probably never going to drive slower than like 30 kilometers an hour. So you don't have to have maximum braking performance there either. And that means you can lower your brake pad type in the rear quite significantly, even below this line. This value becomes worse and it affects uh, sportiness as well as drivability negatively. But not so much that it really hurts us and the drivability increase we get from um, making them tamer to use is outweighing the uh, detrimental effects on the braking distance. So uh, let's move the quality up still a bit more. That significantly reduces the uh, performance penalties from two small brakes. These are starting to get a bit expensive now at plus 10, but this allows us to further downgrade the uh, rear pads and it should be pretty good. So now we have a higher drivability here and um, doing pretty well in the front, not not close to uh, the extra braking performance we would need. But anyway, nothing you can do about this with 10 inch rims. For the aerodynamics, uh, we did see that 
uh, yeah, we can move up this a bit more. 134. Yeah, that's still looking good. Let's do that. Um, the top speed is going up there. We can now reduce this a bit further. As we are getting closer to the final engine. Uh, it should be good like this. And this all stays. And for the suspension tuning, well, um, up this a bit to reduce the bottoming out. Okay, and now let's have another look. So, we are at 579.4 kilograms and 115. So, let me just check what this means. One, but oh, not 507. Uh, one, no, yeah, that was correct. 579.4 times 0.2 and that would be 115.88 and uh, so I was kind of right just reduce it a bit further now we are legal because this one has only 115 it's pretty much at the limit we have 2,000 more monies to put into that but now first of all let's check the performance still 119 uh, that is good. Let's see the round track performance. We are just 0.01 seconds slower than before. So now comes the uh, kind of meter grinder of suspension tuning and other things. First of all though, we want to make the car a bit more expensive. So question is, where do we get the most performance for the car? In this case, we have already considered giving more quality to the brakes and the aerodynamics. There is no need for, for that anymore. Uh, we are not allowed to give the tires any more quality and that would be a significant boost to performance. But we're not allowed to do that. So, where do we put it? Well, answer is in the drivetrain. Because we have a very limited uh, power we can put into the engine but it doesn't tell you anything about how much is allowed to get out at the wheels. So what we want to do is maximize the power transfer to the rear wheels. And this is easily doable by just upping this one. As you can see, the graphs are growing upwards. Also, this is making our car more drivable and just better in general. So uh, we are at plus eight. Let's check the final cost of the car. We still have quite a bit in it. I like that. And then we could also re like up this a bit, up this a bit, and let's see where we are now. Uh, one more step, maybe, maybe at 11. Where are we now? Oh, that was too much. That is really expensive. Uh, maybe for the brakes we are still allowed to go one up. And we are not, no. Uh, we are pretty much dead there. This one probably would work. Yes, all right, let's keep it there. And now we have to reconsider uh, our gearing for the engine. You can see the power band is even smoother now. We have a very nice uh, power delivery to the road. And lots of wheel spin too, but yeah, that's what you, what you have to take. Uh, top speed 233. That went up a bit as well. Let's see, this cooling stuff is still good, but we can move it down one step further. or. We, what we also can do is to highly optimize this car we can uh, put the exact requirement of cooling there and then the brake airflow doing the rest all right uh, very good now the only thing that remains to set up this car to a pretty good standard a very competitive standard actually is to tune the suspension before we do that uh, I'm going to rerun the test and see if we have improved our track time and as you can see we, yes we have that made a huge difference to the car very nice also our weight distribution is still a bit a bit crap uh, kind of acceptable i would say um so now we are in the 240 region and maybe in this video we can even optimize a bit to get to uh, below 240 which would be really fast and that is done in the suspension tab. And now I don't quite know how I should best show this because um, if you ask the experts in the forum, it's basically a trial and error. And uh, well, that's not that fun to look at. But let's go through some very basic stuff for this. 
and that would be you would want to have as soft springs as possible because that gives the most grip possible on a bumpy track and you want to have the most contact with uh, the tarmac as possible and then you want to have reasonably stiff sway bars because if you don't have that then the weight transfer like the roll angle will be higher weight transfer will be higher and as we talked about with the tires these tires are pretty shit so you don't want to put too much weight on them and thus if you want to have a reasonably fast car you definitely are not supposed to give uh, the sway bars low values uh, the damper stiffness usually can be a bit higher and camber especially in martin's challenge is kind of limited by how much tire wear you want to have for your car and a reasonable value is minus 1.5 and i wouldn't go beyond minus two necessarily and yeah let's just check what we can do so this kind of curve you're seeing here is what we aim for but maybe we can get away with a bit softer springs let's see how this is working out so now the springs are softer you have to consider that you are bottoming out more as well um, softer springs definitely help a bit in oh, this was kind of big change wasn't it yeah so let's make it that's not quite as bad but uh, let's keep it at one two and make those a bit harder um, right let's just test this for a moment and see where we are test track that's still 19 good we haven't destroyed it yet that's excellent uh, now we can give the rear a bit more grip with this uh, less anti sway bar gives more grip let's see if that helped oh it actually didn't so let's up this again and this again and this moved it down a bit ah oh, yeah okay right we have to actually move it this way and yeah 120 let's see how much difference that makes uh, this made us slower even so yep as you can see definitely a bit of trial and error we can move this one up a bit more we can move this one up a bit more to get down there again where are we now we are at 122 now well, let's see how that goes and uh, yes yes we are down in the region where we want to go again and uh, let's see if we now just fine-tune those a tiny tiny bit um, we see if things change 21 there and we have a worse time yes and so it goes on and on so if we maybe increase this one a bit and get that one reduced again or up again like this one more yes let's see where we are there and you have to basically try the different types of combinations this one made us slower again so um, yeah oh, basically what you are going to do is uh, choose a um, setting for camber and let's see 22 a setting for camber and just keep the suspension the rest of the suspension constant and then um, try to adjust sway bars till you find the best setting then you adjust to the next step here and you can optimize the sway bars again or see what comes out of it and at the end you will arrive at uh, pretty ridiculous stuff um, there are some weird points in there definitely something we have to look into for for the game in general because there shouldn't be extreme points in a sea of mediocrity in these tuning setups um, it's behaving a bit out of place I would say so this one actually made the car a bit more grippy it seems uh, let's try this one 121 but it may be faster who knows yeah it is than the previous one um, so this is very much trial and error but I assure you if you set up this car like the exact same car we've built here uh, just trying out a few things like try to push this corner this yellow line touching the x-axis as far to the right as possible and then always checking the test track value like push this value as high as possible you will probably be able to with this setup 
get to a 125. And that will mean a track time of around-ish, I would guess, 239.5. And with that time, you definitely are doing pretty well in the uh, 1955 rally, uh, race challenge Martinez setup. All right, I think this should conclude. I hope I, have, uh, I was able to show you how to build a reasonable car um, for the challenge, which is competitive. And all the fine tuning is really not fun to look at, so I'm, I'm skipping that. But there's a lot of more potential in this one. All right, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, and talk to you guys next time.